because there are so many memories wrapped up in food and so much food wrapped up in memory, it's pretty easy, I think, to start pressing the buttons that bring joy to people by giving them delicious food experiences that either take them back to something they've had before and remind them of a joyful time or bring new joy into their lives that they can then share with their nearest and dearest. Today on Dirty Linen, we are talking to one of my absolute favourite people in food. Her name is Alice Saslovsky and I'm so excited for her and for the book that she has brought into the world it is called in praise of veg and it's sitting right next to me like a companion and i know it will be a companion that takes me through the rest of my life it is one of those books that is going to be an essential on australian bookshelves and indeed international bookshelves because i know the book is selling well all around the world it is going to be one of those books alice that when someone wonders what to do with a piece of corn or a zucchini or a cucumber the person standing next to them is going to say well did you ask alice Oh my God. <laughs> so welcome to Daddy Lynn and Alice. Thank you very much. Danny welcome Valid. to my podcast. There is only one way to get you to listen to my podcast and that is to get you on it. So thank you for coming along. <laughs> I have I have listened here and there I'll have you know but that is apt and I take it I will own that (laughs) my dog is looking at you Danny because he can smell your dog through the phone isn't that funny he can smell peppy well at our dogs, Leo basically has brought Peppy up. So thank you for his um, gentlemanly training of my frisky <laughs> little pup. Um, so Alice, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today is joy and the way that you find such joy in food. And I think it's like you, food seems to bring you joy and you seem to find joy in communicating about food to people and it feels like part of your project is for other people to experience joy as they interact with food in a way that you've introduced them to can you talk about joy in relation to food and how that applies to you yes joy is such a um I'm going to say joy is such a visceral emotion because when you feel joy, it comes out of you. It shines out of your face. You can feel it in your fingertips. You vibrate, you buzz, you know, there's an electricity to joy, which is why I think it it sits hand in hand very comfortably with food because food is so multi-sensory as well. Um, And because there are so many memories wrapped up in food and so much food wrapped up in memory, It's pretty easy, I think, to start pressing the buttons that bring joy to people by giving them delicious food experiences that either take them back to something they've had before and remind them of a joyful time or bring new joy into their lives that they can then share with their nearest and dearest. Because I think the reason why that three-letter word speaks so deeply to me is because it always comes back to connection. You know, I love making friends. I love connecting with people and connecting people with interesting ideas, I suppose. So, you know, I think that um, if that connection leads to joy, then they'll keep coming back to me and I'll have a great network of people like you (laughs) who'll call me up and have me on their podcast. (laughs) (laughs) I think one of the things that you also seem to do is to find joy in food for people who haven't really seen it there before you know there is a lot of fear around food a lot of fear around cooking there's a lot of I guess barriers and rules that people put around feeding kids particularly Mm. and I know that's something that you feel pretty strongly about you know where is that nexus between fear and food Mm. and how what are some of your strategies for turning that towards joy? A lot of the fear around food does begin in childhood and a lot of the aversions that we grow up with you know can be tapped back to and experience. I'm I'm pretty much yet to meet a person who deep down hasn't eventually revealed something of themselves and of their childhood, good or bad, that, um, you know, kind of colours their understanding of of food to this day. So um, I would say that the reason why um, I like taking people to that place is because it means that our inner children can can have a little chat a little chin wag you know I'm pretty deeply connected to my inner (laughs) child Um, (laughs) make of that what you will but um, I think coming from that place there's often a lot of healing that can be done Um, there's a lot of empathy that needs to be kind of um, 
in, uh, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, we need to come at people's experience of food with empathy because particularly with intolerances, aversions, um, dietaries, substitutions, to to date, I think there's been a lot of snobbishness around that for people who don't experience those things or perhaps aren't as tapped into those things for themselves. It's just like, oh, it's just part of me, you know. Um, so it's kind of, I think, that there is something really kind of universal about and inclusive about saying, hey, okay, I see you um, and I see that this isn't something that you've enjoyed before, but, you know, let's try Mm. a different way. And that can kind of open up some other channels for that person that, hey, okay, so if I've had these preconceived ideas about food, then what else am I closed to that I need to be a bit more open to, you know, changing my mind about there's a is an there's an element of neuroplasticity i think to being open-minded around food and because it's so multi-sensory um you're rewiring your brain you're changing your mind not just through thought but through taste buds and through touch um and through aroma as well um and yes it comes back to kids and yes as parents as caregivers, as anyone that spends any time with children, we need to be conscious that our baggage is not for them to take on. So just careful the things you say. (laughs) Um, Just kind of be mindful, I suppose, of some of the language that you use around food with kids and some of the attachments that we have. You know, just the other day, um, I was watching my dad um, sitting with Hazy, um, who's, um, you know, almost 20 months old so she's um she's she's very much a toddler but she's very much a toddler that absolutely adores food and I'm not going to say that she eats everything because there have been some things that I've served up and she's just been like oh what is that and I've tasted it and gone oh why did I why didn't I taste this before I gave it to you and what an impeccable palate you have young lady so you know they were they were tests (laughs) Uh, but my my dad was sitting next to her and I sort of looked away for a second and I turned back and he was trying to give her a spoonful of yogurt and I saw that and and I straight away said you know don't don't do that like don't try and feed her she she knows what she's doing she she can self-regulate You don't need to try and stick this spoon towards her mouth because that's only going to do have the opposite effect. And all almost always what we are trying to do with kids comes from a place of love and a place of wanting to do the right thing. It's just not necessarily the right thing to do that that we are doing. So when I say don't be attached, what I mean is um do less. (laughs) So so don't, um, if you can avoid it, don't make a special meal for that child. Often we'll just make, or pretty much always, we make the same thing for Hazy. We have a pinch bowl of salt flakes on the table. I'll under season what we make so that she can eat it and then we'll season at the table. And she's gotten to a point, you'll love this, where she salt bays. So if she feels she'll taste it and if she feels like her <laughs> dish needs a little bit more salt, then she will season it herself. Um, and in doing that, I think I remove for myself a lot of that attachment that comes with, oh, I hope she eats the thing that I've made her specially, you know, or, oh, you know, um, sure. what does she think? You know, it, it's so much tied up to um, what does she think of me as a person, right, of this thing that I'm giving of myself onto this plate. And, <laughs> oh, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot for a kid to take. So do less is my advice there, particularly when it comes to veg. A lot of people are doing um, special meals for adults in their households, not just for the little kids. I mean, what are some of the ways to bring people, uh, I guess, you know, closer to eating from the same pot? Yes, sharing. Um, Share plates, big kind of buffet style, um, you know, the the way that restaurants, this this meal is designed to share. So have little um, additions of garnishes that you know that people might not necessarily like. So for example, if you've got a coriander aversion in the household, then serve up your Mexican fiesta, but have the coriander on the side. And that way there doesn't need to be that conversation of, oh, there's coriander in this, I can't eat it. Because that's annoying for the person that's cooked it. It's also annoying you know, often for the person that that has the aversion themselves because it's almost like saying, well, don't you know this about me? You know, there's a lot of identity around some of these aversions and the, the less that people have to talk about it, I think they'll kind of overcome those, I'm coming back to the attachment word again, naturally. Um, you know, if they have to keep reinforcing that they're a coriander hater, then that's only making them um, double down <laughs> on that hatred. 
right? Yeah. Whereas if it's you're true. if you're kind of offering it um, even for adults, if it's just on the table and everyone else is having it, then you can slowly but surely cultivate a sense of FOMO, um, a positive sense of yes. FOMO to make people want to try new things. <laughs> In an ideal world. Um, so... Alice, you're often described, you're described in all kinds of different ways. You know, when I've heard people introduce you, it's like, you know, a, a master chef contestant, an ex-teacher, obviously an author. What? How would you like to be described? You know, who do you see yourself as? Oh, my, my latest kind of um, the way that I see myself is first and foremost, I'm an active listener. Um, And what that means is a lot of the work that I do is having conversations like this where um, often it's I'm the one doing your job so I'm hosting somebody and listening to their story. And if you actively listen to what it is that they say, then the journey that you can take with that person is far more interesting than if you've got set questions. And the same goes for when I'm interviewed. Um, Often people will ask me similar questions and I'll be listening in to nuance or intonation or kind of maybe even just reading the room to see where the conversation might go that's a bit more interesting the same goes for when I was writing this book I think that when you look at it you know it's close to 500 pages Um, I wrote it so I got the contract at the end of July I started writing probably um, halfway through August because you know me Um, (laughs) and I had to have the manuscript for the reference pages in by Christmas Um, and I just sat and just kind of channeled it I guess I just kind of wrote streams of consciousness every day and there's a certain level of uh, you know listening in that as well um, to to get a bit woo woo that that I I think that that's what I did so I probably um, will say that active listener first and foremost I'm saying cookbook author I'm very comfortable with that at the moment Um, I've stopped saying you'll you'll enjoy this I've stopped saying food literacy advocate I'm off it I'm off it. I'm not off doing stuff within the space, but I think that there's a certain level of expectation and um, kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, assumption that I'm going to be coming from a place of, well, this is what you should do or, you know, why aren't you doing more? I think there's a level of deficit to that title that I don't need um, placed in front of my name or, or next to my name because all I want for people is to have a really great time with food, <laughs> you know, learning about it, um, connecting over it, eating it, having those joyful experiences that give them a lifelong, um, uh, what's the word, a lifelong relationship that is probably one of the closest relationships in their lives, I suppose, because it's quite an intimate one, isn't it? It's like, how much can you listen to your body and how much do you understand that the choices that you make with what you're eating have an impact not just on yourself and on your own well-being and on your own experience of life but also on your community you know in supporting small producers in um, finding opportunities for even just connecting over a meal with someone you haven't seen in ages and also obviously on the planet on the environment and all of those things so um, that's what food literacy means to me but I'm just not using the title because I think labels in my experience um, put people in a box And, you know, Mm. that's not me. It's not my jam. I think one of the things that I really appreciate about the book is that it does feel very inclusive. Like you are bringing people in for a chat and, and, you know, expressing your joy and pleasure that you're finding. But I suppose, you know, one example of the way you do that is that you're not snobbish about frozen veg, for example. Um, And I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, you know, when people talk about eating well or enjoying food, there is, there is a, a lot of, I guess, privileging of, you know, the farmer's markets and uh, organic and local and all that kind of stuff, which is all great, but it's not always accessible to everybody. And I think there is a lot of guilt in, in around food and, you know, especially I suppose people that are trying to feed a family, perhaps on a budget, perhaps in a place where there's not a, amazing access to fresh food. And I think there is, it was really easy for people to build up you know, guilt and shame in the way that they're purchasing food and perhaps in in their lack of, you know, just to use it briefly, their lack of food literacy or their lack of um, confidence in uh, making the most of whatever is available to them. But I I think, you know, we've got a lot of work as communities to bring everybody with us in this idea of finding joy in food, even if it is very simple. And 
to remove some of the stigma around things like, you know, frozen or canned food um, and, you know, just processed food, this whole idea that, you know, processed food is always bad. I mean, most of our food is processed in some way. So I think it's, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah. So anyway, I think um, it's more of a comment, Alice, that I think your book is 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 inclusive. <laughs> but do you think that that's something we do need? Is it something we do need to do more work around, do you think, about bringing bringing more people into the into the food conversation. Yeah, I just, um, you can't see it, but I just stood up. I was like fist pumping um, with with just <laughs> so much um, amen and preach and, um, and yas because that is absolutely, the more barriers that we can remove to entry into this space and the more that we can make being a foodie um, not a dirty word, you know, we could, my family, um, I grew up in the former Soviet Union, you know, we grew up with ration tickets and, and eating what we could grow. And then we came to Australia with, you know, very little. And I would say, you know, growing up, we were a foodie family, but not in the way that um, it's kind of been painted. You know, we had, um, we had delicious food and we always talked about the food on the table and we always, you know, there was a thoughtfulness to it, but it wasn't because it was expensive or because we went to the local farmer's market with our wicker baskets and, you know, picked the the very bushiest um, Dutch carrots, <laughs> you know, there was just a care taken. And I think you are, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. There's a snobbishness and an elitism and a privilege that we need to check. Um, and I know 100% how privileged I am to have grown up in a family that cared enough to impart these lessons, to have me in the kitchen, to, you know, answer my questions and to give me the freedom to be able to, you know, chop and chat and stir and, and, and grow up with this love for food but it is a privilege and it's something that we can totally share um, often in this space you know you and I are both in such a privileged position having the platform that we have to direct a lot of the conversation around food right you know us and our, and our peers and yet a lot of the time there's a temptation and I've felt it myself to write for each other um, that I think we are slowly but surely totally chipping away at and getting rid of and I've learned a lot from you actually you know I remember visiting a restaurant with you in Parkville um, and you were visiting it for one of your Sunday reviews and I was asking you about it this is actually when I was a restaurant critic as well I learned so much from you because I was like setting the bar so high right and you were like no but what about a family that just wants to go out for you know the, the price point is, is here the food you know have they set out to achieve what it is that they or have they achieved what it is that they set out to achieve rather than setting the bar so high that for a lot of people it's just the barrier is too high to enter so you know let's let's get rid of let's let's shrug away from as you say the guilt and the shame that comes with feeling like you're never enough because there's enough of that in this world and food is a place that that should not have those kind of barriers and and those kind of um, the language you know you mentioned processed being a word that um, is quite dirty to some passata is processed <laughs> you know? like um, you know honey is processed <laughs> Stuff yeah. that we use. Rice is right? processed. Exactly. I mean, bloody quinoa is processed, Correct. Guys. It's right. Um. <laughs> well, activated almonds, you've got to process them. So, yeah, and, and you know, we kind of um, hide some of that binary language in words, um, you know, sometimes foods, coming back to kids and um, clean and dirty and all of that kind of language um, that just puts us back, as, as, you know, as I've said, puts us back into boxes and limits our expression and, and kind of puts us back, puts us backwards. Yeah. Let's stop that. Well, when you are using food as a, as a medium and a forum to connect people, then it does seem pretty like counterproductive to then separate, separate people out by, oh, you shop, you shop at a supermarket. Well, that's not okay. I mean, I think, you know, I think what you identified in the way I review restaurants is it's about meeting people where they are. And I think with food, it's really important to meet people where they are. And if they happen to be in aisle five, then that's where they are. Um, and that's, that's fine. And I think, you know, I think, yeah, I think it's really important to just say we're all we're all eating and everyone's doing the best they can and, um, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, as you say, and, and yeah, teaching people to um, lead with their taste buds 
eventually what will happen is that it, they might find that actually it's probably cheaper for me to to shop if I can't get to my local farmer's market. Hey, wait, you know, actually 2020 has opened up the online space where I can order a produce box and get some of that, you know, produce tasting better than I could if I did get it from aisle five. So why don't I, you know, just make little steps and, and kind of move myself down the, the, towards, you know, the spectrum of doing the things that, you know, it might have felt out of out of my um, control or, or out of my realm beforehand, mm. the end, yes. And I think also <laughs> it's one of those things that I think you do so well in this book is, you know, if to really look at a vegetable and I think, you know, if people are able to, you know, let's say buy a pumpkin or buy a cauliflower and there are a bunch of meals in that. And I often find, I think I'm often more and more, I find, you know, okay, when you're asking like, okay, what's for dinner? It's basically, well, I've got this pumpkin or I've got this cauliflower or I've got four sweet potatoes. And it's like, that's basically the meal. And that's, let's say like, you know, that's four or $5. And then around that is maybe there's some, you know, there's a handful of grains or there's some, there's some herbs or there's, you know, whatever's in the bottom of the fridge like that you can you know chop up and roast and put alongside so I think it's um I guess the more confidence that you can inspire and instill around vegetables then I think cooking can become pretty cheap um and hopefully more accessible and less intimidating because you don't have you know 20 ingredients that you need to worry about and it is really a celebration. You can really, really dive in and find the joy in that piece of produce. Yes. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you have read my book more than I have listened to your podcast, Annie <laughs> Fallon. I'm, I promise I'm going to sit down and over the, you know, over the next few weeks I'm going to sit down and I'm going to listen to every one of the episodes. You can test me. God, God, I shouldn't have said that. Look out. <laughs> no, nah, don't worry. You won't. And you know what? Like there's like I don't know, however many months of lockdown through there and um, you don't need to go back in there. You've, you've done at least 100 uh, episodes, haven't you? Yeah. Because I know Huckstep have. And a, you've bit, done... and a bit more. And can yeah. I just say, yes. and I know that like um, – this sounds like I'm backpedaling, but what I will say is that from from when you started the podcast um, to now, the voice that you have brought, you know, to, to be able to give people a voice in a time where it has felt for, for HOSPO that that voice um, is not being heard, um, you're an absolute champion, Danny Vallant, and you are, you know, one of the most influential people in food of 2020 in Australia, according to the Alice Saslavsky opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write a letter. Okay. Well, <laughs> just so you know. We'll, get, we'll edit that all out. Don't yeah, worry. Okay. Um, Fix it up in let's post. talk about, about summer and let's just tell us about a vegetable that you are, you know you're going to love over the next few months. I know I'm going to love tomatoes. I, that, and, I, and I know that that makes me a total basic bitch because, like, who doesn't love summer tomatoes? But I have been itching and raring to introduce hazel wren to heirloom tomatoes and to the sweetness of um, a, a – we've got um, Tommy Toes growing at Nick's parents' farm. So, you know, popping a cherry tomato off the vine – straight into your mouth and as it passes your nostrils inhaling the aroma you know the it's so heady isn't it of of the truss and of the sweetness and so summer so summer exactly so so summer and actually um Anna Roche um I've got quotes in the book from different chefs around the world um Guy Grossi and Anna Roche are my tomato chefs and um Guy um, obviously speaks about Passata Day and, and the, the value and, and importance of that day to his family um but Anna Roche simply just says that you know tomatoes biting into a tomato on a hot summer's day is like drinking a tall glass of water and it really is it's just that fresh pah, burst um a sweet burst of summer juicy tasty so many things you can do with it I'm so I'm just salivating thinking about it the colors of heirloom tomatoes as well there are so many more available there are some great producers of tomatoes nearby um Daniel's Run is one heirloom tomato producer that I'm seeing a lot more of around the place um and that they're really fun to get and you don't you really don't have to do much to them you know just tear some basil leaves get some buffalo mozzarella or some burrata um, I've actually got a giant that's a more um, scamorza um, like looks like a challah um, but it's actually made of mozzarella cheese so like size wise 
I'm not joking. It looks the size of an actual color that you would serve up. So uh, it probably is over a kilogram of mozzarella, and I'm going to have that on the Christmas um, Christmas table with with lots of different kind of different colored tomatoes and um, basil leaves sticking out. So it's going to be so festive. And how lucky are we being in the southern hemisphere that we can have, um, you know. Uh, Christmas colours of tomatoes and basil. <laughs> it's crazy. We're so lucky. Yes. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm doing a tomato salad for Christmas as well and I haven't really decided what. I just wrote down tomato salad. And, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I think there's this, um, I think it's a, a started as an Odalengi recipe where there's some raw and some cooked and it's really just, yeah, it really got, it's just different weights of juices you know the there's the raw juices and the cooked juices um and yeah just uh yeah all different tomatoes they are they're just a gorgeous family they that are. you just want to hang out with totally yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Alice, um, I hope we get to catch up with you again through Dirty Linen's summer series. It's so great to chat to you about food. Um, if you, if you, if there was an alien coming down from space that had never eaten food before because they just didn't need to, oh. what would you tell them about about us humans and and this food thing that we have to do a few times a day? Well, what I would say is that um, yes, we have to do it. But if we have to do it, then we find ways to make it as enjoyable as humanly possible. Um, the crunch, you know, probably I would give some hot chips. Um, I would take the alien <laughs> to Hawks um, in Cape Shank on Bonio <laughs> Road and I would give the alien some hot chips. They, they grow their own potatoes and they press the potatoes through the thingy, depending on which potato is best for the chips, and they triple cook them. And they are better than the triple cooked chips at Dinner by Heston. I know you've tasted them and I know that you agree with me. Um, I, I, actually, I don't know that you agree with me that they are, you know, better than any other restaurant. But as far as chips go, like that is, oh, my God. And I feel like the crunch, the saltiness as well. Uh, I mean, can the alien, has the alien got taste buds? Is that okay for the for us in this hypothetical situation? Yeah, yeah. No, you. I think they can have whatever qualities you want them to have for this for the purposes of this of this experiment yes okay so so this alien is just like a giant mouth um with like <laughs> yep. tiny little like novelty feet um to for my for the purposes of my amusement um and but like the mouth is always in like a perpetual smile so that I feel and nodding so that I feel like, you know, what, what I'm saying is coming through. And, but I digress. So I would um, tell the alien that food to us is not just fuel. Food is family, it's connection, it's memory, it's the potential of food for future generations as well. Um, it's our opportunity to give a, a capsule of a memory to a, another human being on a plate and watch them experience something for the first time that we know they are going to absolutely love. Um, and I think that that's why, that's why I work in food. That's why I'm assuming you do too because what a privilege it is for us to be able to open people's minds and their hearts and their mouths through uh, this magical thing. And at that point, this alien giant mouth, novelty feet big smile nodding would be like wow you know can you pass another chip because I don't have any hands um <laughs> hi Al Alice I live here now more chip please <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah no they are the best chips in the world and I think it's amazing because they cut them in front of you or yeah just right there on the cutter and then throw them in the fryer and they've got this most amazing crispy exterior and so fluffy and creamy inside okay I'm gonna just get in the car and drive down and get some right now but um, Alice, thank you so much for wrapping yourself in the dirty linen today. Um, it's always a pleasure. I live here now. <laughs> we'll <laughs> talk. My dirty we'll living. talk again. Thank soon. you, Benny. <laughs> Thank you. This is Dirty Linen, and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue. 
hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production.